Hospital Kate. There we go, we're live. Good afternoon, folks, and welcome to uh, What the Art, the HOA, the Art HOA with Heart. Today, our special guest is Katrina. She said it was something like pancake once before another thread. So yeah. let Katrina help us out with the last name there. Um, it's pronounced Fancook. Fancook. <laughs> okay. So how are you today, Katrina? I am doing well. I actually already started doing some writing earlier today, so I'm sort of, the afternoon is my writing zone time, so you guys caught me at a good creative momentum time. <laughs> <laughs> How about you? I'm uh, not doing too bad. I uh, kind of relaxed and rested. I'm in a good zone today, you know, as creatives and you're dealing with them, I, you're probably aware that we're not always in a good zone as a creative. Yes, yes. The timing is pretty important. Uh, I'm not sure what time is your peak time of day, because I know everyone's is different. Uh, mine varies, I think, from day to day mm -hmm. and from time to time. Some days I have, it's the case of just getting there and do it, because there isn't really a creative mood that day. It's just a case of, I need to go do it, because it's got to be done. <laughs> It's, I'm always curious how that works with We lost you. Writing is such a deadline oriented thing. Hmm? We may need, from the storm, you're having a little problem. Your voice was cutting out there. You may have to drop your band just a little bit. Okay. Just down a so, little bit. Yeah, because we missed what you said. How's that? Is, is that a little bit better? I guess we'll find out. Always, <laughs> weather's always so friendly, and then the hangouts are empty. Hi, Cheryl. Looks like Cheryl Deuce is here. She says hi. Hi, Cheryl. I'm so excited you stopped by. So, um, yeah, I was asking you if uh, you have a peak time of day in terms, of, like you said, that when you're painting, sometimes you just have to kind of get it done. But I was always curious how that works with painting. You know, with writing, it's it's a very specific thing because there's, you know, usually deadlines involved, but painting is a little bit different. So I'm, I'm curious about that. Well, there can be deadlines. Like, for instance, I have to do a few of what I would consider inexpensive pieces of artwork because at the end of the month I'm doing a demonstration show at a um, festival for the Creek Indians that oh. they hold every year. And so I have to have some to sell as well as what I'm painting while I'm there. Mm -hmm. So, I do, and it varies. The creativity for me is 1% inspiration, the rest of it's perspiration. <laughs> I, I either go in and have something, the inspiration, I see the finished picture. There's mm -hmm. no stages. I know what it looks like from the start. The rest of the time, it's a case of, okay, I want to paint this. That feels good. Um, I don't want to paint that today. I'm not really in the mood. So it's the creative period for me really isn't so much a period of, that I go to work. It's a, those inspirations. Mm -hmm. I, there was one artist, I can't remember his name, and he put it so succinctly, and I totally agree with it, is that inspiration is a rarity. The true artist just gets in and gets to work, is basically what he was saying. Because you can't count on inspiration to always be there for you to want to go paint. Right. The rest of us have to get to work. Well, and then, you know, you might... I think a lot of people also wait for that lightning bolt to take action when really it's the practice and getting up and doing it consistently that allows the creativity to actually flow more freely. It's more frequent. You know, that's that to me is where the practice and the design comes in and the day, days that you have and how you want to craft your, your work life, really. Because for a lot of us, our creativity ties into the work we do. Or, you know, even if it doesn't right now, there are pieces of your creative self that could be expressed more fully in your day, but just aren't because you haven't found a way to kind of pull them all together, right? 
I totally agree with that. And that was one of the reasons I wanted you on the show is because your articles for your kickstart, I loved how you uh, decide that, that you were thinking about new ways to support your readers in 2014. Yep. You obviously wanted to change gears mm -hmm. for what you were doing. So what was, did you decide was a creative's biggest challenge when you were looking at think, and thinking about what to do for 2014? I think it's actually twofold. Part of it is getting out of their head. I feel that they get kind of so stuck in the process of how am I going to get this done or how am I going to connect with this that they actually aren't actively doing anything. So the creativity kickstarts are just really simple ways for them to sort of implement it and think differently because you always have the choice, but if you're stuck in the same rut of thinking, you're not going to do anything different with your behavior. So the creativity kickstarts initially came about when I was thinking about how can I really inspire someone to think differently or change their perspective on something. And then at the same time, I figure that people want to change their routine and how they practice. They sort of need some guidelines on how to do that because the next question is, well, that's great. She told me about that. How, how would I do that? How does that work in my life? So it was actually a twofold thing, and I figured, why not start in the beginning of January when everyone's already kind of coming up with their New Year's resolutions, thinking of different ways that they want to transform or change in the year ahead. So the timing just sort of kind of synced up all together, and I figured that I might as well start the year off with doing things that what I would practice in my own work life or in my own spiritual life and sort of transition that into blog posts that I can help other people. Okay. That's fantastic. I really enjoyed the articles too. And, and I recommend anyone that deals with creativity or mood changes or what, or writer's block or creativity block or just the blah days. <laughs> really, should, the link is in the um, information on the uh, show there on the right hand side down towards the bottom of Katrina's bio. Her link is there for her blog. I recommend everybody that watches the show go check out those kickstarts. Oh, and, and check on them weekly. I know that whether you view yourself as a creative or not, you'll find those beneficial. I think that's such a good point to make, too. I know we were talking about that a little bit in, in the green room, too, that a lot of times the definition of how people look at themselves in a creative way can be sort of limited, but these creativity kickstarts can also help with how you define your own creativity and, and sort of really helping you shift how you can implement more creativity in your regular work so that it doesn't feel like it's something outside of you. It's much more a part of how you are expressing yourself every day. And that's, I think, one of the bigger challenges for people that feel that creativity and work are separate or they're not sure how to pull them together essentially in, in the same vein, right? And if, I think for a lot of people, just having a couple different steps that they practice every day can make a really big difference in how they are actually more creative in their work too. That, those are real good points. And like I was saying earlier, I've enjoyed them. And I've picked up on some of that. And, you know, we tend to allow ourselves to think negative if we don't concentrate on other types of thinking. I don't know if it's just a human factor that's more prevalent in creatives or it's just everybody has it and creatives take it to the extreme, one way or the other, we need those thinking adjustments so that mm -hmm. it can keep us creative and on the right track and moving forward with our goals. Yes, and I completely agree. I know you advocate a well-written, solid bio that you mm -hmm. and here's the interesting part, that you consistently encourage those that bio to be consistent across social and your marketing platforms. Why and how does that help the creative? Or why would they find that helpful? I think one of the bigger challenges for anyone in the world, no matter what you're doing, is to write about yourself. 
it's really hard to sit down and write about what you think your gifts are and what you think other people want to know about you. And there does become a bit of a disconnect when what you say on Twitter is different than what you say on Google+, which is different than what you say in other social media platforms or in your marketing. Not necessarily because you should post different types of information and details, but if people really want to get to know you, they want to know that you're clear and confident and consistent across all these things because that's how they kind of get a sense of, ha, ah, this person's work really resonates with me and these are the reasons why. It helps them to get to know you as a person and essentially some of that creative juice that flows through you and what attracts them to you. So in, in the case like for you, for example, because you actually create art that you sell at different fairs or you create pieces for specific clients, it'd be really great for, you know, wherever you're promoting yourself, that there's just a very simple bio that explains your inspiration, explains why you do what you do, explains some of the road of how you became who you are, because that person is going to be more connected with the artist in you and the creative in you, and that's going to make them want to stay not only in touch with you on social media, but they'll feel more connected to your work and, and the pieces that you're creating. And they'll, even if they aren't necessarily a fit for them, they might remember pieces of your bio and say, hey, I know that he works on these kinds of things and recommends you to someone else or suggest that you work at a different fair or whatever. You know, for, it depends on what your, what your focus is. But for me, I've found in the past that when I work with um, photographers and other artists, the, their biggest challenge is making sure that what they're saying is consistent across all the platforms so that they're marketing themselves in the most effective way. Okay, and, th and that makes a lot of sense. Now, and the nice thing about what you just described there is wouldn't you agree that that probably applies across the board whether you're an artist or consider yourself a creative or whether you're just marketing and sold about? Yes, absolutely. I think that the artists or creative people that identify themselves in that way sometimes have a little bit more of a challenge with talking about themselves consistently because they wear a lot of hats and because they want to kind of put themselves out there more. But especially with business folks, I think they've got a little bit more of a, a focus that they try to kind of replicate in other areas. But I agree, it's, it's essential for either end of the spectrum. I just found that in terms of the clients and some of the other creatives that I work with, that's a lot of what they come to me for help with too, is just sort of saying, these are some things I'd like to say about myself and I'm not really sure how to put them together in a way that sounds like me. Even though writing about yourself should be easy, like I was saying, it is one of the more challenging things. So having that perspective and consistency, I think really helps not only them when they're doing their elevator speech and talking with other people about what they do, but really sort of helping across the board with creating a brand that's consistent and getting people to realize what you're doing no matter what platform or how they hear about you. Yeah, and branding is, you know, that's one of the hardest things to understand for people too, I think, that are mm -hmm. just kind of starting out with marketing themselves. or Because as an artist or creative, you kind of sit back and you go, well, what is my brand? How do I determine what my brand is? Is it what I paint? Mm -hmm. Is it the type of paint I use? It, it, that's not really understood right off the bat. And what the brand is, is basically, as a creative, it's us. Mm -hmm. We have to help people see that we're doing what we love, and we love to share what we do so that mm -hmm. others have the opportunity to maybe that special moment or special visit that you captured unknowingly in your artwork touches their heart. I've had many of my clients that uh, are collectors, rather, that they wanted the painting because it reminded them of home or their childhood or their grandparents, you know, something special in their life. And that's our ability to do that as a creative. That's really our brand. Right. I absolutely agree. I mean, when you look at how a piece of artwork or anything that you're creating connects with another person or brings them to a place of joy or happiness or shows them the path to something that maybe they didn't realize they still loved in their own heart, it's, it's a really beautiful thing to be able to do that. And it's, it's wonderful that as 
you know, in the line of creative work that you do, I'll just call it that because I know that is there is a business part of, you know, selling artwork and things like that. I can't imagine what it must like or feel like in your heart when you can see that on someone's face too. You know, it's it's a great it's a great opportunity to not only feel good about what you do, but knowing that you're helping someone else connect in a new way to their own creative space, whatever that may be. Uh, that's an expression that's hard to explain to someone else. To you're right. It, it, it's a very special feeling when they want it because you've touched their heart. Mm -hmm. In my case, my paintings when I'm painting them. I know those paintings are right, whether I like the finished product or not, because I made a connection with my heart to the canvas. At that point, those are the paintings I found that other people want the most. Yes. Oh, I, I completely agree. And, you know, I feel the same way when I write certain blog posts that sometimes, you know, the marketer in me is sitting down with me as the creator in me is writing and thinking, oh, is this post going to go anywhere? Are people going to really relate to this? But at the end of the day, I have to go with what my heart is telling me and what I really feel that I want to share that week. Because, you know, I post twice a week. But it's important for me to listen to that because in the posts where I try to make it too much about what I think someone else might want or well. Yeah, um... That's one thing, you're right, that I've been struggling with on um, figuring out topics for the show and everything, is mm -hmm. thinking what people want to hear versus feeling what people want to hear or see about. Because yes. we, we can air that away all too easy. Now, you talked about something interesting in part of your coaching and encouragement and mm -hmm. you talked about a creative partner. So yes. how does one find a creative partner? That's a very good question. And mainly because it's important to have more than one. Right? A lot of people think that, hey, if I just find this one other person, that they can be the go-to person that I ask all the time for every single thing. But as you know, humans are very multifaceted people. We have a lot of different passions. We have a lot of different interests and ideas. And so I feel it's really important that if you're very passionate about a certain area, that you kind of find different people that connect with you in those areas that not only that you trust, but you feel that they're integrous, that you feel that they're going to be truthful and honest with you if that's what you're looking for, or can really provide a balanced sense of feedback for you because otherwise we're just sort of all out here on our own in our own heads doing our own thing and I think it's really important that you don't sort of pile all that onto one person because one person can't be all of those things for you so maybe there's someone that in particular you really trust their opinion about different paints and the quality of paints for example then you would probably talk with them about that versus another person that paints more often or maybe paints landscapes or paints something a little bit different, you would probably ask their opinion more so about different styles of painting or how to capture a certain moment in an environment. So I know that these people aren't necessarily super easy to find, but I do think it's important that as you're building the community that you're spending time and sort of finding those folks for yourself that you know will sort of show up and give you those little insights at times when you can get stuck in your own mind about things. Um, in terms of actually finding these people, it could be in a lot of different ways. Obviously, Google Plus is an amazing way to do that. There's obviously in-person meetings and networking and stuff like that. I know that for me, in the terms of just the types of things that I'm interested in, I want to know about things that are specifically about entrepreneurship. There's some folks locally that I connect with. As far as the things that you and I are discussing today, most of the contacts that I have on Google Plus are people that I turn to first. So it's just been interesting how I've been able to sort of find those different pieces, but it's taken some time to build that. So finding this creative partner then is a lot like just building your community or your relationships. Yes, yes. And, and making sure that you're coming from a place of sharing 
it's not necessarily about whose brain can I pick and then take that and use it. It's is there a, a person or, or a few different people that you really want to build a relationship with and actually have that mutual sharing and respect there? Do you want to contribute to some of their ideas and vice versa? Do you want to go to their hangouts and support them and the things that they're doing as well? And I do think it does take time. You have to sort of experiment with certain people and see how that goes. And some of them may be short-term experiments and you've had a connection for a while and then you do what you would like to do together and then you move on to someone else. But I do think if you can have a core of, I mean, at least for me, there's about three or four people that I, I go to on a regular basis about specific things that I found that works well for me. It doesn't necessarily mean that I'm not looking for more, though. So <laughs> it's important to sort of keep an open mind as you're meeting new people and building community online that you sort of keep a set fresh, fresh set of eyes, especially as you come up with new projects, right? Because if you're doing new and innovative things, you probably want to connect with other people that are sort of more in alignment with new and innovative projects that you're working on, too. Oh, appreciate the tips there. Um, real quick shout out to Kristen Drysdale. She's in the audience. She says hi to Tim and Katrina. Hello. Uh, sorry for the delay there, Kristen, but the topic was just so interesting that I didn't want to break the thread there. Uh, the other thing that I was noticed that I found interesting is that when you were talking about this creative partner to share ideas with, Mm -hmm. You mentioned that it could be could provide a good mirror of how to help you get out of your head mm -hmm. about what appeals to an audience. I absolutely agree with that. That is an excellent point. When you're too isolated, you're sort of just left wondering, like you said, you want to listen to your heart and what your heart's telling you, but there is the real world out there, and it's important to have some interaction in the real world and having other people mirror that for you in terms of just their perspective and you know especially if you're connecting with people that you find are of high integrity and can provide you an exchange in value in that way it's it helps build trust in what you're doing you know we can't operate in a in an, a uh, what's the best word I can use for that I know I want to say a man on an island you know by himself doesn't get very far but it's sort of that same mentality is that every idea that you have is either going to be great or negative if you don't have someone else to sort of mirror that idea back to you and, and give you some feedback on that. So you're absolutely right. I think anyone that can provide you with a powerful mirror is very, very helpful in your creative development in many ways. Right, well now we're going to ask you a nice toughie here. Um, okay. You, in your weekly kickstarts this year, you've talked about things like discovering and building creative resources, physical mm -hmm. movement, brainstorming, mm -hmm. joy, creative budget, um, tracking inspiration, volunteering for a project, and innumerable others, including creating a brag book. If you had to pick just a few of those to apply right now and every day and you had to drop all the rest of them, Hmm. What what would you consider to be the most important points of those topics you discussed? That's a very, very good question. Um, I love that question mainly because I pretty much sit at the computer every Sunday and go, all right, what do I need to write for this week? But I think that in terms of the posts that I've written so far to date for the creative creativity kickstarts, the creative budget is a big one, mainly because it sort of ties into a lot of posts together. But creative budget that you create is how you can kind of show up in life. And all those pieces tying them together, I sort of offer a perspective of how to do that in a practical way. So that in and of itself, I think, if you don't read any of my other posts, reading that one I think would be extremely helpful. And then I know that I had written one about release. Because release is extremely important when you're carrying around a lot of extra baggage, a lot of old ideas or fears and judgments and hurts that hurts that really aren't serving you anymore, that doesn't allow for new creative ideas or, or creative confidence to really build within you. So it's important to let an idea, if it's past its time, let it go. If it's a relationship that's past its time, maybe it's it's really worth examining if, if it's ready for its own demise, <laughs> I guess is the best way to put it. So I think if you could kind of read those two posts, those would be really great. 
And then, let's see, there's one other one. I think I also wrote one about breaking your own rules. When we get really stuck in our own head, we have these set of rules that we feel that we have to follow all the time. And then when we get too regimented in those, we kind of get into a rut. And we feel, basically, we kind of make our creativity one-dimensional instead of multi-dimensional. So it can really help to look at what you think your own creative rules are and say, hey, which one am I ready to break? It doesn't have to be all of them, but I think, you know, kind of getting outside your own comfort zone is, is really helpful too. So those would be my top three if I was gonna if I was gonna suggest any to people that already don't read my blog or don't know me. Uh, I have to agree with you there. Those are definitely very um, informative. They're good at making you look at yourself, and it looks like we lost Katrina there. Nope. Oh, there she's back. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and I, like I said, I know from reading yours, Kickstarts, mm -hmm. once I found you here on Google+, Plus, I, I went back and I looked at some of these, and I read them, and every so often I'll go re-look at one. Like while I was preparing the show for today, I went back and touched on it. said, hey, no, no, I read that. Why don't I remember it? You know, and go back and review the article. because And I love the way your blog is laid out because you've got those nice little clips when mm -hmm. you do a search that kind of lead into your blog. Um, and at that point, then you've got the link to send them on if they want to read more about that topic. No. Yeah, there's the, the having a clean looking website was very important to me, especially because there's so many ways that you can easily get lost <laughs> on someone's website. And I know that for right now, in terms of how people find me, it is primarily through my blog. So I wanted to make sure it was very easy for people to get around and search different topics too. So thank you so much for saying that because it's the same sort of thing. If people aren't really giving you any feedback, you just assume like, well, no one's complaining, so I guess it's cool. <laughs> it's all working out, right? I try to t have a positive attitude towards things. I'm very much the kind of person that if I'm not hearing static, that I'm trusting my gut and I'm going with what I've already made a decision on. It's just when the static comes up a little bit, that's when I try to revisit things a little bit. So um, I think that's another good tip for a lot of creative folks, especially when they're putting their branding together and their marketing together. Um, are you getting feedback on some of these things, not only for your site, but what are people saying about it exactly? Can you ask a couple different people that you trust, like, what do you think about how everything is kind of looking online? So I do appreciate you saying that because that was definitely one of my goals in creating a clean site. I wanted it to be easy for people to use. Well, um, like I said, it, it's a very nice format when you do your search, especially the way those lay out. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times if you do a search on someone's site, there's not a whole lot of information to let you know whether or not. So you have to click this link and go over there again, and click that <laughs> link and go over there again. And I know my website needs some improvement on that. And I like the idea and the cleanness of it. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Now, do you have anything else that you think that would help with in mind with everything we've talked about today? Let's see. I, I think for most people, adding an element of their day where they are experiencing some level of their own creativity can be very challenging. So I encourage a lot of people to find a time of the day where they can practice that. I'm not necessarily sure for every person, obviously, they may be a morning person, an evening person, whatever that looks like. Um, Ultimately, it's about connecting with what you feel are your creative sources are and finding a space to do that. Because if you're not setting aside a time to do that and building that into a practice, you're actually really losing a lot of time to connect with some amazing ideas that may be showing up. You know, some people get ideas and dreams and they can write them down really quick, but just imagine how much more would open up to you if you spent a little bit of time every single day doing that. Even if you're not necessarily creating something, if you're just kind of taking that time to, to sort of be quiet and sort of flow with something, or it's some of some of the time it may be a practice that you're doing, other times it may just be sort of saying, hey, if I was going to create anything, what would that be today? 
So I think that's a very powerful and helpful practice to do on a daily basis. And then, Fantastic. Go ahead. Oh, sure. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, you're all right. Go ahead. You were you had another thought. Yeah, I had another thought. I'm, I'm, I'm in, in that vein, I'm actually very curious to find out about what inspires you in terms of when you're painting something or when you're thinking about how am I going to get into my process for the day. I'm really curious about what that looks like for you because we haven't really talked about that. I know that you're talking about connecting with heart and figuring out, you know, what what wants to come out of you. But you know, there's a lot of vast things that you could paint. So that's that's a really big canvas for you to kind of operate from from the first place. So I'm I'm curious about how your process works a little bit. And, and that excellent timing because my next question to you was going to be, do you have any questions you'd like to ask of me or someone in the audience? Mm -hmm. And to address your question of how I determine what I'm going to paint, it's probably 1% inspiration. The rest of the time, I just have to get to work. Mm -hmm. uh, so as I approach the canvas, I decide, OK, these are the things I like. This is what I enjoy painting. Mm -hmm. And so it might be, I want to paint mountains today, or I want to paint a particular type of tree, like I really like the sequoias and the redwoods, mm -hmm. bark texture and everything. Um, I like waterfalls, so I'll, maybe that day that painting is a waterfall. Uh, the Mesa country out in Mexico, Utah, and Arizona, that Four Corners area with Colorado there and you know the northern part. Mm -hmm. I love the scenery there. I drove semi for seven and a half years cross country and I saw a lot of things mm -hmm. that I had so my creative palette if you will has a lot of options in it to choose what I would like to do. Whereas, I didn't know you had been in Colorado because that's where I live. I've been, I've been to Denver, I've been over Donner Pass, running down into Reno, and then across and over to you that way, and it's, it's, a, it's a nice ride. Yeah, um, it's I, beautiful. There's so many things, I'm sure, so many inspirations just driving around between, like, the green areas and then the desert areas. It's a lot of different palette colors, you know, a lot of options there, too. Yeah, there really is. There's... Uh, the variety of color, the, and the time of day changes that. The, mm -hmm. the way the weather is that particular day changes that. Um, the mood you have that particular day, are you more wide awake? Are you kind of tired because it's what you do day before you shut down driving? Um, there's all these different factors that, because you you see the ocean, you see the beautiful tree country, you see the beautiful rivers and waterfalls and the lakes and the Mesa country and the desert. I, I love driving across the desert. There's, most people are going, oh, I just find here so dull, it's so hot. But there's such a variety out there of plant life that can capture your, your eye and especially in the spring and the early summer when things are still in bloom. Those are all inspirations for me as far as what I'm going to paint today. Mm -hmm. The inspiration part, if I'm inspired by a painting, it literally blinds me because I see mm -hmm. nothing around me except the finished painting. And those don't come very often. Mm -hmm. um, in the last two years, I've probably had three, maybe four paintings that have hit me like that. Um, then I have the touchstone inspirations where, like with my octopus's garden, my son was whistling octopus's garden. So I did the research on octopus's garden and what their bedroom or whatever would look like. Mm. Then the rest of the time, it's... Part of what I feel that day versus 
if I could be anywhere I wanted today, where would I be? And I may paint that. Or mm -hmm. maybe I'm in a special mood or feeling so that I feel like painting the Native American cultural art that I do. Right. So And the steps towards that, I don't really plan out. I just go to the canvas and it kind of flows out. There's no um, step by step except for, okay, this is how I want it to look so I know that I'll, once I approach that subject is how I go about doing whatever painting or whether I paint the background or the ground or the sky or whatever that day. Um, some paintings I can do quickly in the day depending on what they are. Mm -hmm. Other paintings because of what I want to put into it, it has to be layered and dried so that the next layer doesn't out over dry it and crack the surface right. where I'm adding texture and stuff. And so that varies day to day. It must be hard for you to pick a favorite one, do you? Uh, favorite one? Yeah. Um, it's hard to pick, I bet. Yeah, but I hadn't really given it my thought about a favorite one. Mm -hmm. um, I think I enjoy the mesas and the deserts the mm -hmm. most. What I really like doing is um, when I, because I'm also an amateur astronomer, astronomer, come on, tell me what. And like with the horses in heaven that Scott right. did the um, Scott treatment too. Um, that particular painting combines my love of astronomy with what touched my heart. And I like doing stuff like that too, uh, where I can combine some aspect of astronomy whether it's in a constellation or a planet surface or whatever. Um, so again, another subject matter that mm -hmm. where do I want to go with it? Go, like I did a watercolor with a planet surface, not Earth, that the moon or planet, whatever I decided it was, mm -hmm. had other moons around it, and but the whole thing was in a nebula. And uh -huh. So it just various little things like that, that, and it depends on how the mood strikes me when I start that particular subject matter. Uh, I let the feeling between me and the canvas and me and the subject guide me to what I do towards the finished product. Well, you know, you had, I mentioned, or you mentioned something quickly in your bio that you wrote like a sci-fi short story. So that's always really interesting too. Like, how would, do do you still write, or do you want to continue writing, or do you mostly paint now? Um, I've thought about writing some more, mm -hmm. and the um, when I wrote that short story bio, uh, there was a lot of editing to my original story that it kind of changed the direction of where I wanted the story to go so that I could kind of create a, mm -hmm. con make a continuing sequel. And, you know, there's potential in that story to create a sequel or a, eventually turn it into a full-fledged uh, publication and everything. It's, but it's a fantasy fiction. Mm -hmm. um, not so much fantasy, uh, not so much sci-fi and not so much fantasy is kind of a blend of the two. Oh, gotcha. The, so the how, funny part how was your writing process, though? I'm curious about, like, the, the writing process, because if you're usually used to painting, how was it for you to actually, you know, switch gears a little bit and do some writing? It was just... i got to thank my friend Bob Bello for that. Um, um, because I was on a website that he had started up for scientists, sci-fi interest artists, and he kind of encouraged me on the writing part of it and everything because of some of the things I was painting. You know, I've been thinking about these stories that 
this particular story was actually inspired by an old Andre Norton series. Oh, okay. And um, she, um, excuse me, hair. <laughs> but, and this particular storyline that she had, I've always enjoyed. Uh, it was her Moon of Three Rings series, is how I refer to it. Um, and I kind of took it off a tangent of that, that um, So you were doing some like early fan fiction. <laughs> okay, that that's a good description of it. I, that, I hadn't yeah. It, but yeah, that's kind of it. So, but the storyline took off in a direction of that. This was an offspring of the relationship that developed in that Moon of Three Rings series, mm -hmm. and it was about a young man that had inherited his parents' space vessel mm -hmm. and he went through the galaxy with other friends that he had made that, and they were performing through this particular story. They kind of split between doing a performance type deal as well as doing um, a minor freight. <laughs> type thing. They were, you know, an independent operator in space. They mm -hmm. did what paid the bills and let them travel around because they were basically space gypsy feeling. Oh, okay, gotcha. And that particular story, they were trapped on a planet. Mm -hmm. That, or correction, not a planet, an asteroid for an asteroid mining project because pirates had captured part of the mining process that was on another major asteroid in near vicinity to where the base was. So is it fun to like play with all the different possibilities? Sometimes I feel like it's a little easier to have a starting point and that allows you to be a lot more creative in writing because you sort of feel like, hey, there's some solid characters, there's a solid story base, and then you get to kind of take it into a whole new direction that's more interesting to you. So did you find that that helped a lot to have some sort of basis or someplace to start? Yeah, I can say that it was definitely the factor of having the memories of enjoyment of reading those Andre Norton novels that gave me a basis of where I wanted to go with this little short story. And I've had people ask me about writing another sequence of it. In mm -hmm. fact, we let, the story left a cliffhanger kind of type deal to where if I wanted to do subsequent short stories or a novel or whatever, the lead-in is at the end of that story. Um, I just, I haven't, painting calls me more gotcha. than writing. So it, art to me is more active than sitting and writing. My blog, anybody that goes to my website will see that my blogging is nowhere near probably what it should be compared to what I like to do with the artwork itself. So I need, one thing I did learn though, I never realized that Ammon Jones, when he was on the show, more or less between him and the Scott treatment that mm -hmm. Scott so lovingly gave of that particular segment of the show, helped me see that I am a storyteller. I never considered myself a storyteller. But since that time, I can tell more and more that, yeah, okay. So as I approach my paintings now, I okay, what story do I want to tell in the painting? And how am I going to pay, uh, explain that in writing so people can understand what moves me to paint this and why it was painted that way. I think and, that's a beautiful way to do that, especially because to me when I'm looking at either photography 
or paintings or other types of artwork, it is telling me a story. It may not necessarily always be the story that you're intending, but it's a story that resonates with me when I take it in, right? So I think that for me, it's it's always about knowing what the artist had in mind, but then taking that interpretation further and saying, how is this tell a story for me, and how does it resonate with me specifically? I love that you do that. I appreciate your comment, your compliment there. The uh, We've reached the time in the show now where we do the demonstration part of it. Um, for those that want to dabble along or just watch, I'm going to change cameras here. We'll change over to the canvas, and then I'll be moving over there. And I haven't left you, Katrina. I've just no turned worry. the camera off to focus on the other one. <laughs> And we're going to move over here. And today we're going to do a little bit about skies. Let's see if it stands where I'm kill all the light. <laughs> yeah, we're going to do a little bit of sky and clouds today. Uh, we're going to start off with just a little bit of we're going to use cerulean and light tonight. I'm not really a big fan of white, but you can't really get the right color you need if you if you don't use the white. But in this one, the few times I will use white in a painting because of, I'm kind of strange in that I don't approve of what some would call a pure color. And, it, and it's not a case of I don't approve of it in other people's paintings. It's a case of, for me, if it's too obviously manufactured, it's mm -hmm. it's not real enough. You make that look so easy. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't want the sky the same tone all the way through either. Because if you look up into the sky, depending on where you're looking at in the sky, the tone is different too. And it's just basically at this point, we're just screwing a little paint here. Mm -hmm. That's actually one of my favorite things to do is just lay in the grass and look up at the clouds. It's so relaxing. Well, you're going to like what we do here, because we're going to play a little bit with the clouds here shortly. It's always fun to play the game with what you're going to see in the clouds. Yeah, that's a game that my wife actually got me to play them, and I usually never really thought that much about. <laughs> All right, that's the sky in. Oh, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous blue. And one thing I've found is that the cameras now show the uh, colors on my painting well at all. They're actually pretty bad at it. So what kind of brush do you use to get that a more poofy effect? For the clouds or for yeah. what I just did? Yeah, the little edge that you just created, it looks sort of like a cloud edge, right? But at the same time a sky edge, at least that's what I see. I see Are you gold. talking right in here? Yeah, I'm curious what kind of brush you use to get that. Well, that's actually um, what I would consider near a horizon line. Let's see what we did over here. All this is is a um, it's actually a one inch house painting brush, but it's mm -hmm. it's horsehair instead of nylon. 
Um, I like the natural bristles better for painting than I do the uh, synthetic bristles. I'll, I have some synthetic bristles, and they're okay, but they're not my preferred. All right. Now, there are multiple ways I do clouds. But one of the things that I've seen happen when I'm watching other artists, the art shows or whatever, that is they tend to mistake the fact that clouds are always kind of like Accountability kind of like this. And we can up some more light here. And that's titanium white that I'm using for clouds. I use a different one from when I'm blending. If I want to make clouds, I tend to use the titanium white. But you like those big fluffy thunderhead type clouds? Is basically what you're talking about. I like those. You like these nice, billowy, fluffy. Oh, those look nice. I, I actually see a lot of your back, though, so I can see you kind of painting, but I can see more of your shoulder. That's a little better. <laughs> now, if you'll notice, you've got that fluffy that you were talking about. The nice, the puffy, top of your clouds. And they look real. <laughs> Then another type of cloud that most people don't think that much about is this type here. And most people don't think about the clouds that are just kind of wispy when mm -hmm. they think about a painting. Well, they help out after this. There, it's nice. See, and it's a totally different effect to the painting. Kind of a more light area type cloud. So, and that's just a couple of ways you can do a cloud. Now, the neat thing about this particular cloud here, and I came prepared to do, do that, is we can kind of hang that cloud up a little bit.
and then they turn them into a storm cloud coming towards us. I hear rain clouds come along. <laughs> Another type of cloud I've painted before is Just almost see it. Right even here. You don't use a lot of paint. In fact, you do what I would consider a dry brush effect. Just touch me just enough. Color. A little bit of something there. So, and it all depends on what the subject I want, on um, which type of cloud I'll take. Uh, and the nice thing about it is, every, excuse me, every one of these clouds can be used. And it'll change the mood of the painting depending on what you use. We're nearing the end of our show here now, and I want to thank you. Am I going to? Oh, there it goes. That's supposed to be in there. That's, that's there we go. We appreciate you coming on the show, Katrina. We really enjoyed having you with us. And appreciate everyone stopping by and watching the show. The link to Katrina's website is, and I believe I said it to where her blog is, is in the link in the description section of today's show. Um, what is your heart what touches your heart the most for Katrina. me yes um, helping other people truly connect with their creativity and expressing that in the world is what I absolutely love to do I love helping guide them helping giving them insights like collaborating with them whatever that looks like so that they're sharing their brightest and best expression in the world and that is what I'm very very passionate about Great. And, you know, and that's, go ahead. I was just saying, thank you so much for having me on the show today, too. It's been great to just get to know you a little bit better and chat with you about what your passions are as well and get a sense of what it's like when you're sort of in that moment of painting. That's just really cool to sort of see you in your process and how you go about what you do. And the clouds looked great. They came out beautiful. Thank you very much. And well, again, we appreciate having you. Thank you for agreeing to show up for the show. Um, for my heart is um, one thing that I've mentioned before on this show, and I'll mention again today, is go here on Google Plus, check out the center, and they're a um, rehab. 
uh, from Green Independent Living Center that mm -hmm. helps those with disabilities. And I'd encourage everybody to go check out. Erin is a wonderful person. She's their social manager. And connect with them here on Google+. Plus. Um, they've got a wonderful art program going there. And they can use your help. A lot of these people are really fantastic artists. But the impression I got is they're painting on a medium to low quality paper. They're not on canvas board or canvas. And some of these artists deserve a better media to mm -hmm. paint on. And they don't have it themselves. And anything that's donatable, I mean, anything that's donated to that center, if you've got a few dollars or if you want to just buy some go to Walmart and buy a stack of canvas boards or whatever for five or ten bucks for a few of them. I know they'll be greatly appreciated by those budding artists there and the um, I'm and hoping that very soon to be able to work out something with them so that we can show some of their artwork here on what the art as well as on Longwell Arts website. Stop by the website. I do have a few stories that I've written there for different things. Um, there's also my art is for, available for payment there along with an ability to buy it if you decide you want to. But that's how you can find me. It's here on Google Plus is Longwell Art or Tim Longwell. And again, this is what the art the HOA, the Art HOA with Heart. We ask that each and every one of you look into your hearts, find what touches your hearts, and share and support others. And thank you again, everyone, for watching. Until next week.